Hey, Pastor Scott Farrell here. Welcome to Encounter Christ Church. It's Father's Day. What's that mean? Well, you know, I could ask 20 people as I walked outside today and they tell me 20 different things. Uh, remember, I'm the same pastor on Mother's Day. Didn't have a lot of kind things to say. And I told you ladies, so listen up. I said, Father's Day is coming. It's here, so now it's, it's Dad's turn. Because uh, I'm talking about present day people, not past day people, right? We've seen fathers and mothers not really evolve for the best over the last several years. And remember, my, my, uh, my parenting, so to speak, my tentacles go back to the late 1800s with my great-grandma and what she taught me. And then my grandpa, so my grandpa was born in 1901, I think, and the other one was 1903. So progresses a ways. Now look at today's modern-day father. It's not flattering. We've changed quite a bit in 100-plus years. So I'm going to address this today from a perspective, biblical perspective, not just my own because I can hammer people all day. However, we're not going to do that today, but I, I'm going to hammer me for a little bit. So before I do that, let's go ahead and go to the website. If you have any questions, prayer requests, whatever, uh, encounterchrist.org is how you reach us. We are a praying church. We will take care of you. Let's go ahead and open up a prayer. We've got to have the Holy Spirit here today and we'll get going. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to be here with us and always dwell within us and your spirit in us. And thank you for everything you did at the cross. Amen. All right, so full disclosure from me, before I start bashing fathers, right, and talking about the biblical perspective of being a dad, I've got to be honest about me. All right, if, if you haven't seen my story, you haven't seen the movie about my life, I'm going to tell the truth. I was a teenage father, don't remember anything. I was so high on drugs that, um, and, and had some head injuries to where I don't remember much. I meet my son when he was 12. I was thrilled. I was happy to be a father. Uh, it looked like me, so it was hard to run from him, but I didn't want to. He was a great kid. He was, he was me, just younger. Then about the age of 18, he comes to live with me. That didn't go well. I'll go over that why that happened in a minute. But, and then we sporadically haven't seen each other. We live in different states. Um, he's got a different perspective on me. He says I've made the whole thing up. Trust me, I, I don't remember anything. And then recently, probably while I was sick, I remember I was terminally ill. He called me, I think it was on Father's Day, I can't remember, everything's still a little cloudy, and just basically said, I don't ever want to see you, I don't want you in my life, and goodbye. That was the end of that. So that's my father, and then I went on to be a stepfather, raise, help raise my, my wife's kids, but the thing again, age is going to matter. I get the youngest at six and a half and the other one at ten, and I'm going to get ready to draw up why that matters here in a second. So the oldest leaves to go live with his father. The youngest I poured my heart and soul into, and now he has nothing to do with me. So I'm going to go over why that takes place, because we like to go, well, you just should have been better. Stop. That's not the case. I'm going to outline why this type of thing happens. But I'm also going to outline the only way to fix it. And because our whole world's on fire, yesterday Congress decided to make the draft effective again. Now, it's got to go to the Senate and come back. So if you don't understand, if you haven't had a civics class or they didn't teach you that, but 1826, mandatory females this time. Now, what's that mean? Our government's getting to get us in a war we have no business being in, just like Vietnam. My cousin came home physically, but never mentally. I had a lot of friends in that basket. Um, and then Korea, my dad, my father-in-law, most of the men I knew, and World War II was necessary. So now we've got another made-up war. Why? Because fathers don't stand up. Okay, so let's, let's go over that. So now let's go present day. Now let's talk about dads. Go in your Bibles to Proverbs 22, 6. We like to quote this a lot of times in a negative fashion instead of quoting in a positive fashion because a lot of times we like to shape verses to mean what we want them to mean instead of here's what God said. All right, so I'm going to go King James. Now, if you ever want to know, why does you use King James? Why does you use Amplified? Uh, my Greek experts tell me the Amplify is probably the closest to the original word. I use the King James because then it would probably be the second or third closest. All right, so train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Okay. Seems pretty easy. And if you've ever been in a classroom, especially kindergarten, it'll have a little poster with all these characteristics on it. And it'll say, your average kindergarten teacher can tell you the future of your child, which is true. Why? Probably by the time we get them, four, four to six years old, I used to teach kindergarten. 
their parents have imprinted on them the rest of their lives. So let's, let's go over why this matters. Okay, so let's say dad and mom. Now mom's over here just as a qualifier. We're focused on dad. All right, child. Okay, from zero to seven, without exception, remember, my mentor was a Piagetian theorist, theorist and uh, that's how I was done. Take a, it's coffee talk today. We're doing this relaxed. So Duncan's always nice to me. Kid was really nice today. I need you to pray for the kid that did this. He was in a car accident a couple months ago, and he had a scar from the top of his hand all the way to his elbow. Somebody ran into him in Atlanta. That's not a far-fetched idea. And they had to put a rod in his arm. So if you guys will pray for this kid, it'd be great for full hearing healing, and then let's get the rod out of his arm, supernaturally. All right, so now, this is why this doesn't, this is why this matters, right, on who raises your kids and who's around them. Okay, from a magnetic standpoint and a quantum standpoint and a behavioral standpoint, whatever is around this child and touches their five senses, they will become. So from zero to seven, they're automatically in something called theta, that's hypnosis. So every single thing that touches them, they will become. Why would you think God would say this first? Train up a child, they will not depart from it. Okay. Dad and mom, so we're going with dad and mom being together. I realize the divorce rate's 56% in the church. I got it. But let's somewhat be wholesome today, right? Little house on the prairie day. So child, okay. So anything their five senses touches from zero to seven, they will automatically repeat. Okay. Let's look at my family. The only people I can normally pick on is me, right? My mom and dad were both alcoholics and not very nice people when they got drunk. You can imagine. And on top of that, we believe my mom had bipolar disorder. On top of that, like most women in the 60s who had a hysterectomy, they also put the ladies on mommy's little helpers. So I had Jack Daniels, mommy little helper, sleeping pills, and anger. It was a blast. So from zero to seven, the great thing about me was I had wonderful grandparents. I had four wonderful aunts. My uncles to this day, I still idolize. They're both World War II veterans. One was at the Battle of Midway. So he's always my all-time hero. And my great-grandma, both grandmas, um, and all my cousins. I have seven cousins that I love and adore. And then on top of it, I had a Jackie, a Steve, and a Nana. Um, the reason why I lay black girls. Uh, I had a black lady raising me. So I was cushioned from this because I had such a support system, I always felt loved. Now, I never felt loved from these two, got fixed later if you've heard the story, but we're just doing zero to seven. I don't have one memory of my father when I was a child, not one. My dad was always working. Wasn't that what every dad did in the 60s? They were always at work. My dad worked 12 to 15 hours a day but he was doing it to take care of us. I mean, so I, I get that. That's what everybody I knew's dad worked all the time because they had to put food on the table. Moms didn't work. It's a different time period. I don't really remember my dad till about the age of eight when I started playing football. After I stopped playing football, my dad disappeared again. Just wanted an athlete. I didn't want to play anymore. I wasn't going to dance. So we, as fathers, whatever we do, our kids become, mom and dad, tag team, whoever's around them most of the time, programs them. All right, God knew that because back then you became an adult at 12 and 13, right? Bat mitzvah and bat mitzvah. So if we know this, why do we keep messing it up? Really, I mean, seriously. Because what's our job as, as, as dad? CEO, supposed to be. Although if you look at Hollywood and commercials, now we're buffoons who don't know how to do anything. Again, we did this. We've let women take over everything. Our job as CEO is vision, a plan, purpose, preparation, and a fire truck outside if you can hear the siren. So CEO, overall vision of the family, of your life, everything, you gotta have a plan, you gotta have something to execute. You gotta have a purpose, why am I here? Why was I developed? And then you have to be prepared to do whatever it is. It's, it's much like coaching, which I was a high school coach, or like the military, you've gotta have this. Now, 
let's think about the average birth now. I remember back in the old days where they held, this was, this was the birth when I was birthed. A bottle of Jack Daniels and cigars. Out in the waiting room because men weren't allowed. So all they do is drink and smoke cigars. Sound about right? Watch Mad Men. That's what happens. Now the men are in. I, I got to see a baby born, caught them. So it's changed. Now, why do men, men bring balls and soccer balls, footballs, basketballs to the hospital? Is that kid coming out at 18 years old? Full grown, ready to play? It's like gender reveal parties. I just want to beat my head on a desk every time I think about this. What happened to the days where you just called your family and said, hey, we're having a boy, we're having a girl? Oh, that was too easy. Now everything's a celebration. When everything's a celebration, nothing is. Keep that in mind. When everybody graduates, nobody graduates. No, it's a money-making enterprise. So let's look at this, okay? If I'm going to train up a child, and I'm a Christian, now I'm talking to believers now because this is a church and I'm a pastor, then that means that I was made by God. If I'm made by God, not you, I realize it was your sperm and egg, but I was made by God. That means God's got a plan and purpose for my life and a vision. So me as a dad, CEO, I'm driving the company, true. But I've got to make sure, and I, I, I'm a company, I, I advise companies all the time. And I always tell people to make sure your employees are performing their skill set within your company. And if they can't perform their skill set, don't hire them. Or if they don't fit your company, help them get a different job that matches their skill set which I do when I go in and consult. If I have to fire somebody and they're a good person, I just help them get a new job. I normally do the firing when I come in. So if this is true, that means me as dad, I'm not really dad. See, that's God's job. So God's father, I'm not. He's the father. I'm the babysitter. It's my job to care for God's child and get that child to God's purpose, plan, direction for their life as quickly as possible. Not mine, but God's. That being said, if I'm getting them ready for God's purpose, plan, direction, that means I have to be godly. I always tell people, we're normally raised by Satan from zero to seven. Because even though people go to church, they're not really believers. If Barn is right, it's about 13% 13, 13 of the population that say they're believers are really evangelicals, which means they read the Bible, believe it's infallible, and do what it says. <clears throat> that means that, let's do the math here, 87% don't do that, which means 87% are raised by Satan. If that was not true, why would every single vice or sin or corruption be on the rise right now across the world? Even though we have the highest church attendance we've had in history. Think about that. So I'm the babysitter. Okay. So let's look at the babysitter. So go to first Timothy three and we're going to look at the babysitter's description of being hired. Coffee time. Thank you, Duncan. People look at me like I got three heads when I do this because you're the architect of your child's life, but it's got to be based on their father's vision. We act like we did something. We had sex and uh, fertilized an egg. Woo, man, I'm in there. No, it starts at when they get here. It actually starts in the third trimester. So let's go. All right, these are the qualifications if you wanted to be a bishop or deacon or worker in the church. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desireth a good work. Okay? These qualifications are who you, as a man of God, raising kids, as a babysitter, taking care of God's children, getting them to their plan, you must possess these characteristics. Or you're doing it wrong. A bishop must be blameless. That means that nobody can bring an account of you doing anything that's not pure and godly. The husband of one wife, now a lot of people get this confused. No, this does not mean that you were divorced. This means you got a wife, that's the only wife you, you, you're with, and that's it. Because if you look at the context of when this was happening, guys were up to a lot of stuff they weren't supposed to be. They were still just coming out of the pagan where they could do whatever they wanted to. 
And they carried some of those behaviors with them into the church. He's saying, can't do that. Vigilant, sober. Right now, alcohol abuse is at the highest and drug abuse is the highest it's ever been in society. Granted, we have more people. Good behavior. That means behavior when you go out and you go in. Remember, integrity is what you do when you're not seen. And then good manners is what you do when it is seen. But you know how to act. I can say that now. Did anybody teach you ever to act? And the kids look at me like, what are you talking about? Hmm, I see you've never had missed manners. Given to hospitality, apt to teach. you got to be able to teach. See, what's our job as fathers? Got to teach. Every life skill out there, mom and dad teach. I'm seeing a lot of kids right now without life skills. Because mom and dad never taught me anything. Did my dad teach me anything? I can do barbed wire fence. I know how to farm. I'm Ralphie. I knew how to use profanity when mad. That's it. Okay. That's what I learned. All right. Uh, not given the wine, still. Not a striker. Now, remember back in these days, people liked a little wine. They liked to get drunk. Pagans go to, go to church. At that time, would have uh, perverse sex and get drunk in the temples. And then if you didn't like anybody, you just popped them. So imagine walking into church. I don't really like you. Okay. As a pastor, got a few people I like to pop, but you just don't do it, right? Um, but that's what they do. Not, not greedy of filthy lucre. You're not making money that's not justified. As Gumber Paul would say, no ill-gotten gains. Be patient, but not a brawler, not covetous. So uh, he's got something I want it. Go wearing your own stuff. One that ruleth his well his own house, which means the kids understand who they are, they understand the rules of the home, they understand the rules of decent society, and they understand that they're a piece of that community in decent society, and that's the only way they're going to be able to be successful. And it's an open line of communication, and the father's teaching the child how to do it right. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. They understand he's the boss. He has final say-so. That's it, period. I did understand in my home. Once my dad was talking, I was closed. And then I understood also that if he asked me to do something, I had better be up and walking in one direction by the time he was finished with it. Those Korean War dads and those World War II dads, which I had two godfathers, both World War II Marines. So you can imagine what that was like, right? So two Marines from World War II. Yeah, you can imagine. But I loved them, and, I, and they taught me a lot, but I knew where that line was. For if a man know not how to rule his own home, how should he take care of the church of God? How could he know how to take care of God's children? I use this to hire people. Because if you can't make this list, why should you work for me? Male and female. So since you're the chairman, you understand this. See, most people think these kids are theirs. And we got all absentee fathers. The black community is 78% out of wedlock. Hispanic is 62 and white's 59 so we don't even have fathers. Look at all the gang violence we have now. Why do we have it? Why do we have all the political corruption? Men stop being men. So let's go over this. So now, you have to lay out the blueprint with mom, because it, it takes two people to do this, and then enforce it. Okay, let me go over developmental stages so you'll know. Zero to two, three, three to five, five to seven to eight, eight to 13, 13 to 18. Those are developmental stages. Now, in the behavioral world, from programming, it's 0 to 7, 7, 13, 13, 18. You can look it up on the internet, trust me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm actually using my degree here. But here's what we do. We want to pigeonhole our kids into what we want, right? Look at travel ball. Travel ball should have never happened. AAU's gotten so out of sync, and now we feel like we have to keep our kids busy all the time, and then we go back to the Mona Lisa veto treatment, right? She's on the stand of my cousin Jenny. My father's father's a mechanic, my father's a mechanic, all my uncle's mechanics, my brother's mechanics, my cousin's mechanics. What if that's not God's purpose for your child's life? 
My dad wanted a hunter and a fisher. I, I'm on the autism spectrum. I want, I, Star Trek was my favorite show. I had a fascination with trains, and I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. I was not exactly a dream for my father, and I was fascinated with space. So I wanted to be a, a, a NASA engineer. I was a nightmare. They used to ask me why I couldn't be normal. My brother liked to hunt and fish, and I liked being out in the woods, but I liked being out in the woods for a whole different reason, right? The botany part of it or, or whatever. So my father never, ever, ever, ever wanted to be around me, and my father would buy me presents not to go on family vacations. So the three of them could go and I would stay home with my grandparents, which I was fine because I loved and adored my grandparents. But where was the direction? So by the time I'm a teenager, I'm a drug addict, an alcoholic, and a Satanist. Can you see how that would work out? Even though, you know, I had, again, great grandmas. The reason I'm still here today and not in prison is because of my grandmothers and my aunts. My Aunt Frances would have killed me. She just recently died, so now I'm safe. But the first time my wife ever met my Aunt Frances, within five minutes, she already hit me in the head. That's just how our family was. So, but I loved her. She loved me. It was a love tap, even though it was really hard, and I got an hour of headache. But I said something about her brother, my father. She didn't like it. She loved and adored my dad. But can you see how fast this could go off the rails? Quickly. So since we know this now, since you hold the keys to the outcome of your child's life, get the, let me, should I say that again? You hold the keys to the outcome of your child's life. Your child's entire self-esteem, who they are, their belonging, everything, hinges on how you treat them. Look at uh, John, John Etheridge, Wild at Heart. They do Wild at Heart camps in Colorado. Great guy, good book for damaged men. No, we don't go up and chant and all that. We just go eat, barbecue, fish, hang out. But the whole premise is, who was your father? Your father didn't raise you. Your father's in heaven. And they teach you how to reconnect everything that you have back to your, your father, God not your earthly babysitter. All right, so let's, let's look over this. Now, if you're wondering what's not on the job description, let's go over it. All right, this is what I see from observation. Again, when I go out in public, people act like I'm deaf and blind. And they just talk freely into my ear. And I try not to listen. I even put my headphones in, but sometimes it's so captivating I have to listen. All right, this is what's not on the list to teach your kids from 0 to 7, 7 to 13, or 13 to 18. To be a ball player. Now, caveat. If they're naturally gifted, still the best athlete I ever saw in a high school was Jeff Francoeur. Coach, the kid was amazing. Uh, amazing kid, great parents. Uh, people asked me one time, what's it like to see all the kids you ever coached go into the pros, become coaches, become high school coaches, go on the star? Great. And they'll go, isn't it great you impacted their life? Time out. I didn't impact their life. They impacted mine. Uh, that was their mother and father. Their mothers and fathers are the reasons why they're D1 athletes and going to the pros and going to be great high school coaches, not me. I was just there for the ride. I didn't birth them. I didn't raise them. I didn't feed them. All I did was teach them some skill sets that they already possess. I just had to make them better. Help them learn to work as a team. And then mom and dad handled the rest, especially their dads. I was blessed here in Georgia I had the greatest set of fathers I think I've ever had. We were just there. I told them when to show up for practice, what uniform to wear and what to do in the game, and mom and dad handled the rest. So that's what bugs me about that. But not a ball player till God deems them the ball player, and then you'll know just through natural skill set. All right, next, drugs. Drugs and alcohol. Anywhere in the Bible, 66 books, does it say teach your kids how to drink and do drugs or how to tap a keg when they're six? or how to go get a six-pack at the store, me, back in the old days, right? When they'd give you some money and go in the store and get the six-pack, because you already knew the guy that owned the place. I lived down the country. Or to get the white liquor out of the bottle. I, I knew how to pour white liquor from the steel into a glass jar. I think by the five, right? So to be the cool kid. Really, I mean, I see parents now trying to be their kids. Dads all the time being buffoons at the ball field or at school trying to be cool. If you really look at the evolution of the cool kids, cool kids don't have a good life once they get out of high school. And normally that's the best thing they ever experience, and it just gets worse from there. So you don't want to do that. Insecurity. <coughs> if you're secure in Christ, 
and who made you and your purpose and why you're here and why you're doing this and your skill set, how can you be insecure? See, insecurity comes from your protector, dad, not protected, not schooling, not teaching, not being there. Blame and anger. I don't remember God saying in the Bible, teach your kids how to blame everybody else for what they've done, not themselves, and how to be angry at the world. Trust me, I grew up in a house full of anger. And it was rock'em, sock'em, robots every night. It was awful. But I knew a lot of people like that. So, you know, it was a different time. And uh, it wasn't a lot of fun. Malice, envy, strife. Sounds like one of those housewife shows. But isn't that what we're teaching our kids? The way I see fathers acting in public now? Unforgiveness. This is a biggie because the great thing was I got all this worked out with my dad, but by the time he died, we were best buddies. Uh, he got saved and, and everything was gone, right? He asked for forgiveness, I gave it. We have to learn how to forgive. If you look at Mark 11, 25, 26, if you don't forgive, your father can't forgive you. Your father, not your babysitter, but your father. We forgive not for the other person, for us, because we can't carry that around. Our father told us we can't do that. Jail. It is amazing. Uh, John Boy and Billy, a, a show I grew up listening to in Charlotte, they do the Earl Ray, whatever it is, police report. And it seems like everybody named Earl or Ray or has two names goes to jail. And then they back that up with stupid crypt news. And then if you go on YouTube and you watch any episodes of Cops or whatever, where do all these guys learn this? Chances are, if you've been in jail, your kids are going to be, yeah. Aren't behaviors learned? If behaviors are learned, nobody comes out of the womb nice. Just give one toy and 12 two-year-olds and we'll see Battle Royale. Then everything's learned. If everything's learned, they learned it from somebody, right? Violence, mistreatment. Weakness, I've already put that. So all these things are not positives. Now I know we live in a victim society and we men have stopped doing our job so we've gotten to where excellence is, is, is everybody's managed to be an excellent, but if you're terrible, we should celebrate you. That's idiotic, all right? Compromise. No, I don't compromise on anything. Now people go, well, you're married. I still don't compromise. Here's the difference. When I said I would marry my wife and love and cherish her, I, my goal when I get up is to make my wife feel loved. And if I'm doing something that makes her feel loved, I'm all in. But if it's something that compromises who I am as a man, the answer is no. So people already know ahead of time, you don't ask me something that compromises who I am as a person. I'll do anything my wife wants me to do if it's something that pleases her, shows her how much I love you, and it's biblically sound. No problem. If you get over here in the gray area, there's no gray area with me. I'm black and white. Remember, I'm on the spectrum. So there is no gray with me. So we don't compromise our principles. I love teaching because I refuse to compromise my principles and go along with the left-wing agenda, where I watched Christian after Christian after Christian compromise theirs so they could get a paycheck. I just went out and made my own. Confusion and chaos. Well, since Satan's your father most of the time, he's the father of lies, confusion, and chaos, and that's what we have in this world right now, right? Slander, laziness. We got a lazy group of people, not Gen X, but probably YZ, millennials. Now, who teaches? See, lazy is also a learned behavior. All behaviors learned. Keep that in mind. Every behavior displayed is learned. You don't display something you have not repetitiously done. So, if your child's lazy, it's because you let him be lazy. Simple. Something for nothing. For some reason, people think you should receive something for no effort. No, it's give and receive. Sow and reap. A feeling's not facts. Wow. AOC. God bless her. I know it's Father's Day, but this quote's too great. Just because it's factual doesn't mean it's moral. What? Pardon? That was her, her reasoning behind transgender stuff. Just because they're not women doesn't mean we shouldn't let them be women. Again, tomorrow I'm going to be an NBA player that's 6'8", and I'm an all-star. 
and I'm gonna walk around and tell everybody I'm a black guy who's six eight and an all star, and I'm Michael Jordan's twin, and I'm gonna identify as that. Idiotic, passive aggressive. Where do people learn how to be passive aggressive? Oh, it's passed down. No, it's not through it's familiar spirits, but it's through behavior that's been displayed. I love you, I don't. I'm gonna push you. I'm gonna pull you. I love you. Get away from me. You're right. You're wrong. Activities. We seem to think that if we can put our kids in enough activities, we can feel good about us. Go on YouTube and type in parent reactions to sports. You will see parents trying to fight officials in an eight-year-old basketball game. I watched one yesterday. They're eight. They're still eight. Almost every time they go down the floor, somebody walks, somebody travels, somebody throws the ball away, they can't shoot. If you called every single foul and walk, it would be five hours of a game. You got to let it go. You only call the most egregious. That's it. You can't really start calling stuff till you get to junior high. Because at junior high, they still struggle. So you got to... But it's... We've enrolling kids into activities to validate our existence, not theirs. Our kid got up one day and he goes, you know, I don't really want to play. Am I going to be a pro? No, you're terrible. Okay, I want to quit. All right, good. Let's get on to what you can do. Now, the coach called me and wanted to berate me. I said, zip it. He's not your kid. Shut your mouth. He said, I don't want to play anymore. He's horrible. This is how you validate you. I don't validate me by my kid being on some stupid team. Because my father told me I'd better get him into his purpose plan direction as quickly as possible. I've already paid you. What do you care? I'm not asking for my money back. This guy just wanted to go do a trip, and without us, he couldn't go. Take your family on vacation. Who cares? He don't want to play anymore. And I, no, I'm not real big on quitting. But he was, he was not the best. And he didn't want to play anymore. And there's some other factors with our family that were causing a lot of problems. And so I just said, quit. We're done here. So we activity our kids up trying to justify our existence. Okay? Immaturity. Wow. Remember those scales I went over for maturity maturation schedules? Now, it should be 13 to 18. Now it's like 16 to 25. We're seeing a lot of immature individuals in the world. Not good. Strictness. Now, I want the papers. I ask the questions. We don't need Nazi Germany in the household. No. Why are you doing this? Let's get it straight. Let's go on. It's like the way I discipline. My wife's youngest would always go, can Scott discipline me? Because <laughs> here's how I do it. You knew the rule. You broke it. Here's the punishment. That's it. That's how I taught. That's how I coached. You know you're going to have to run out of practice because you were late. Let's go. And he'd come in, i go, you know the rule, right? Repeat the rule to me, thank you. You know the punishment, right? All right, let's get going. i got stuff to do. How hard is that? No screaming, no hollering, nothing. Why? See, because you don't have to get the belt if you've already taught them rule matter, your word matters. Let's go on. It's just a blip in the radar. Let's go. That's what you do with employees, right? You're late. You know what the deal is. Let's go. we got a job to do. We don't need the, the exchange. Berating, just went over that one. Beatings. Now, do you believe in corporal punishment? Well, it's used in sports, it's used in the military, it's used in everyday office. All corporal punishment is, it's the group tired of your crap and handling it on their own. You're talking about beating. Do I subscribe to beatings? Of course not. My dad hit me one time and then apologized. My dad never laid a finger on me. I was so... I understood respect for him. All he had to do was stare at me. And my dad had a lot of patience with my idiot behavior, so I got away with a lot. And eventually, he'd give me a smack in the head, but I probably had it coming an hour earlier. My mother, on the other hand, liked the beatings. It's kind of like the, uh, the joke with offices. Uh, the beatings will continue until the morale improves. <clears throat> Beating kids never works. Beating people never works. However, correction does. You always got to remember, you don't ever correct a child angry. You don't ever correct an employee angry. <clears throat> you never correct a player angry, even though I would yell at kids for effect. Big difference. But see, as soon as they went back over the black line, I was hugging and kissing and told them I loved them. 
Same thing in the military. I got to get you ready so you don't die. See, we correct because he expects it. Spell the rod, spoil, uh, what, spare the rod, spoil the child. It doesn't mean a rod. It means the vehicle it's going to take to get you to where you're supposed to be. Every kid has to be disciplined differently. Now, the rules can be the same, but how you enforce those rules for that child's personality is different. Sometimes you can just have a sharp word to a kid and they crumble. Sometimes you can just stare at them. Sometimes you have to enforce it. Depends on the kid. However, if you start this outright, because they know boundaries are boundaries and they mean something, then you don't have to do any of this. See, you have to do this. You have to go to the, the big option when you haven't done any of this. It's like in my classroom. I had the worst of the worst and the worst in a lot of classes. They had rap sheets this thick. I never had behavior problems. I made them make the rules, they enforced the rules, and then they got mad at everybody that broke them. Why? We were a group, we were a team. Even though I'm the head honcho, it's not any fun if I have to lord over them. See, in the family, it's no fun if you have to lord over them. They have to understand you got their back and you love them, but you're doing what God told you to do. So, pride, selfishness. Well, we learn pride and selfishness from our parents, right? So if I'm full of pride and I'm selfish, guess what my kids are going to act like? I tell people all the time, the worst kids I hated teaching weren't the ones from the ghetto. I love those kids, man. I always had the best. Give me some kids from the ghetto anytime. It's the kids from households of a million dollars or more a year. You talk about pride and selfishness, they're pain. Because they're mirroring, again, they didn't create these behaviors. They're just mirroring what they see at home. Um, don't major in, 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 the, in the minors. Don't take something that's small and make it a big deal. It is what it is. Period. Leave it where it is. Just handle it. The pets get more love than the kids. Right now, I think half the wives in America became between the dog and the husband. Take the husband. We treat our, like, we'll, we'll treat our kids like, okay, you just rub some dirt on it, you're good. If the dog gets a scratch, we take them to the vet. Okay, that's an all-cash business. They don't take insurance. But we won't take our kid. We won't take care of our kid the way we take care of our pet. That's stupid. All right, so now let's look at how to do it right. If we're going to do it right, when my kids see me, they should see the Father. Do your kids see God, Jesus, when they see you? Or they see Satan? Which one is it? Be a good idea once we're done talking here to get up and go, who am I mirroring today? Is it God or is it Satan? Considering that all behaviors they displayed, they've seen myself or my wife display. Because people always go, oh, he never acts like that at home. I used to just stare at people. Really? So he invented that behavior just for my classroom? And then I had somebody try to get me fired for actually explaining Piagetti theory on the board during a parent conference. And then they explained to that parent, well, he's the expert in that, so um, he's right. And then they had to come back with, that's not how I feel. Still the facts. All right, so what's it take to do the job correctly? All right, strength. Stay on your ground. Be a man of God. Stand on the word. Oh, it's amazing that Fauci finally admitted all those guidelines from the CDC were all crap. I taught physics. I told people from the start. Six feet. If you got central air, we're all dead anyway. Doesn't matter. And we all have a natural immune system, so the faster we get it, the faster we get over it. Masks don't work. Particle physics says that any virus has a particle size that is too small to contain by cloth. You have to have a self-sustaining oxygen tank. Okay, next, love. Well, we can always get to 1 Corinthians 13. However, every time you see God in the Bible, all 66 books, the word is really love. And every time you see love, you see God. God is love. You should mirror that. Now, love doesn't mean that we're singing Kumbaya every night by the fire. Love is discipline. Love is love. Love is hugging. Love is kissing. Love is making them get up and do chores. Love is making them go to school and learn. That's love. 
Why? You're equipping God's army. See, your 0 to 18 is basic. So you're getting them through basic training to go fight the war against Satan. If your basic training is flawed, they die. Protection. I had to explain to somebody one time, you don't mess with my kids. You're going to be graveyard dead. You mess with my family and my kids. I asked a guy one time, I said, do you really want me to go back to being Satan's employee? You won't like him. Because he has zero feelings, zero concerts. And I'll take it. I'll make this. Just like Denzel Washington said, I promised somebody one time I wouldn't do this again. But for you, I'm going to make an exception. And I told this guy, I will make an exception for you. Let me know what you choose. Protect your kids. Why do we have so many child abductions? Because men are going along with it. Why do we have so many people trying to destroy the church? Men have gone along with it. Why is Washington running rampant? Men have gone along. Should I keep? There's a whole laundry list here. We haven't done our job. We don't take care of our families. We're too busy filming what's going on with people. We're too busy filming that guy get beat up in the street or that lady or whatever it is instead of taking a baseball bat and splitting that guy's skull open. As you can tell, I'm not a passive person. I would rather take a tire iron and beat you to death with it than tell you about Jesus. But guess what? The Father said, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that anymore because he gave me love. He gave me a conscience. God, those things get in the way sometimes. I didn't have one pre-Jesus. Now I got one post-Jesus, and it's conflicting sometimes. Trust me, there's a lot of us out there that got saved that weren't good people. Do you really want to reactivate that? Just don't mess with my family. People need validation. I've heard you. I'm listening. I love you. Doesn't mean I agree with anything that came out of your mouth. Doesn't mean you're going to get away with it. I know you exist. I was, I was telling my wife, and again, it sounds like I'm bashing my father. I'm just telling stories. Remember, Pop and I worked everything out. My father, after the age of 12, did not know that I played three sports. Had never seen me perform. I was pretty good. I'm a professional musician. My father never saw me perform. He never saw me play one soccer game, one tennis match. Didn't even know what I was doing. I don't think to this day he knew what day I was graduating, but he did show up. He did not know anything about my life and was kind enough to take me out to dinner one night for a hamburger and tell me that and then told me I wasn't worth it um, and then explained to me how he really felt about me as a human. Now, I quit school that day. Actually, I got thrown out, but I had it coming. Now, the principal let me come back and graduate because he understood the situation was not wonderful. But I never received validation that I was alive. That's why working for Satan was so attractive because I could do horrible things and they validated the horrible things. So keep that in mind. Direction, wisdom. See, wisdom is listening to God. Well, you got to look at God's word to listen to God. You father, father models. Direction comes from, all right, I read the Bible. I know what my skill set is. And I'm going to follow that because we have three jobs. Heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. Most people will never be pastors, but they will have a marketplace ministry. It's the fastest way to win people to Christ, always. But you have to be a devout follower of Jesus first to do all this. Show up for church. Teach your kids to pray. Read the Bible with them and to them. Doesn't mean listening to the local Christian radio station. Most of that music's crap anyway. No, in the hall, once the door's shut, are you reading the Bible? Are you teaching them to pray? Are you teaching them with God things really are possible? Or are you teaching them that God's got their back? Because you got their back. The only way kids think God's got their back is if you do. If you're strong, God's strong. If you're weak, God's weak. I drove to L.A. I had to film a commercial out there. and I'm, I'm one of these guys who wants to see all the continental states. So I drove. I don't know if I ever do that again. Man, that's a long drive to L.A. Wow. I didn't realize how far it was, so you get in the car and go do it. Thank God we weren't in a paneled station wagon with six kids in the back. I probably would have killed everybody. It would have looked like Christmas vacation or vacation. But I went out there, and, and, and along the way, I talked about 300 teenagers, right? Stop at restaurants, or I think we've stopped at every Love's gas station between here and L.A. And I go, hey, uh, how old are you? Do you go to church? Mom and dad at home? Same question. Most of the time, the parents were divorced. None of them, all of them went to church. That was the funny thing. They went to church, but post-18, they never went back. 300 kids never went back. Why? 
If you don't see it replicated at home, you're not going to do it as an adult. Train up a way, train up a child in a way this should go, and they will not depart from it. I think back to my ball team. Again, I had nothing to do with their character. Their character came from their dads. And they all had, it's funny, they all had great fathers. And those men are now great fathers. I sent two happy birthdays last week. Uh, one's 41, one's 42 now. Boy, that dates how old I am, doesn't it? Uh, when I got them at 14, a little time passed, isn't it? But it was their fathers. They all had character. They all had discipline. They all had direction. They all had the wisdom. Because our self-esteem, we, we've become the self-esteem generation. Where I, I gotta feel me, I gotta be me. Shut up. No, what you gotta be is self-discipline because self-discipline brings self-esteem. Doing a job well brings self-esteem. Just making up some stupid mantra out of positive thinking ain't gonna work. Not, and, and let's look at it, body positivity. Miss, Miss Alabama, 350 pounds. You can be pretty and big, but you can't be healthy. And why are we letting girls like that win? I mean, seriously. It is what it is. We got girls in dresses and high heels who look good. Let's pick the prettiest one and go home. It's called a beauty pageant for a reason. I married Miss Gainesville High School and Peach Bowl Princess from the University of Georgia and Tridel Social Director. Is that right? Yes, Tridel Social Director. And if y'all see my wife, she's Elle Woods from Legally Blonde. All right. I knew what I was getting. I was getting a beauty queen who's pretty. That's what I dialed up and ordered. Now, all my beauty queens had different looks, but they're all beauty queens. Previous girlfriend was a Ford model. She's black with a fro and looked like uh, Pam Greer from Foxy Brown. She was 5'11". I'm 5'7 and a half. Do the math because she liked to wear heels. But they were all looked like they were cut out of the same mold. A beauty pageant. Ford model. Come on. Let the elevator go to the top. I'm the type of stripper where I start out naked and they pay me to put my clothes back on. I got enough sense to realize, hey, maybe maybe I'm not calendar material, unless it's Larry the Cable Guy's calendar. Then you could put me on there. I could probably be Mr. January on that one. But not anybody else's. We've decided to replace facts and figures and common sense with this is how I feel. It's just like I, I do left-wing shows, right? Because it's fun, and it's fun to tease them. <sighs> Male... Gender, you know, okay, I work with a lot of people that are confused, and I work with a lot of people that have either transitioned from male to female or whatever, they'll call me. You cannot be a female if you started out male, and you can't be a male if you started out female or, or whatever. You can't be a female and turn to male. Why? You weren't born with the actual plumbing, right? You don't have fallopian tubes, you don't have a womb, you don't have a uterus, it's not going to work. You can cosmetically look that way, but you can never be, and here's why. God didn't make you that way. Plus, you will die if you start to transition to something you're not because your body's going to reject every single thing you do and you will die. Now, some people, I, I talked to somebody one time and I appreciated their candor. I was doing a study on why people do what they do. And I sat down with someone who had transitioned from uh, male to female. And we had a great three-hour conversation, very candid. I said, all right, I'm going to be open. You be open. Let's, I'm going to write this down. I said, did you know what was happening when you went in? Yes. Okay, so you're cool with what's going on? Yes. Okay, I appreciate your, your candor on that. They were cool with shortening their life to do what they wanted. All right, you're a consenting adult, you're over 18, that's your choice. How do we get there? How does a child think they're one or the other, right? So how do people say, I was born this way? And absent of this, and an overbearing one of these. That's how you get there. See, you're not born to think you're male if you're not. You're not born to think you're female if you're not born that way. That is integrated. Look, they're trying to transition kids to three or four. Can't pick your baby time. Can't even poop yet without help. But you can pick your gender. Considering that from a maturation schedule, we do not have the ability to abstract think till we're 14. So you're asking a child to abstractly think about something at three when we know, through brain science, it's 14 to 16 now. Why is that happening? Because men didn't do their job. Sense of accomplishment, job well done. Where did they get that from? Us. I work hard, you're going to work hard. We instilled, God bless my wife's youngest, because I believed in chores. Now, he's got a fat bank account, 
three cars paid for, and living the life he wants. Why? He has work ethic. He understood that he had to accomplish something. See, through accomplishment, through a job well done, we develop our self-esteem. I was good at math. I was a grade, at one time I was two grades ahead of math. Couldn't read a lick. And to this day, I still have trouble writing. I've gotten a little better. Um, I have dyslexia. So reading was hard. I could do math. That's why I wanted to be an engineer. A job well done. I could go through a math sequence so fast it was easy for me. I was bored. I took geometry at 11. Okay, that's something they teach now in high school at 10th grade. I was 11 years old. 15-year-olds are taking that. I just went through. I just got it. It's the only thing I got. And then when I got to physics, I felt like I was home because it was easy for me. It's like I got through college, four years of college, and didn't open a book. People are still calling me names over that. I didn't have to. I can remember the whole lecture. But I couldn't read it. So was opening the book really going to help me? So I had to adapt and get on. But I had a sense of accomplishment. Now, we also have to be quick to listen. Who are we listening to? How do we learn to listen? Dads, have something to say. Don't go on. and sh Shut up. If five words to do it, why use 20? Quick to listen. Teach your kids how to listen to you because if you just go on and on, they're not going to listen to you. I know so many guys who just like to hear themselves talk. Shut up. State the facts as fast as you can. Just the facts, ma'am. Joe Friday was right. State them, move on. But teach them that everything that comes out of your mouth is worth listening to. Because if it's out of your mouth, it's everything coming out of the Father's mouth is going to be worth listening to. If they can't listen to you, they won't listen to him. Understanding. Now, this is a different understanding. This is listening to your kids and validating that you've heard them, then giving feedback. My wife and I do this. I look at my wife and I go, coach or husband? Okay? Because I've got to validate whatever she says. If I'm husband, I shut up and listen and I'm never allowed to speak. I just listen. Can't fix it, can't solve it, nothing. If she says husband, then coach, what I'll do is listen and then solve. A lot of times I never have to be coach. She just needs, and then she'll get up and leave. All right, I'm done. All right, good. All right. Why don't we do that with our kids? Kids don't go home and tell you anything because you'll overreact, and you won't really listen to what's going on. Kids do go through a lot, even more now than we did when we were kids. Because the great thing about being a kid in the 70s, we only had to deal with sex and drinking and drugs. Free love society back then, right? And drag race, and where I was, we we drink white liquor and whatever and drag race. Yeah, not a good idea. And then we threw guns in the equation. But we're all here. We all have all ten fingers and toes, and we're still in one piece. But we didn't go over the line. We're just country boys having a good time. <coughs> now, you got the internet. You got every perverse thing out there. You got drug cartels trying to kill drugs. I still don't understand that. Why would you put fentanyl on all your drugs? You're killing your own client base. Still don't understand that one. Wouldn't you want them to stick around? Because for everyone that dies, you just lost $1,000 a client per year. Now, if it's cocaine, it's 100000 a year. But it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but I have to listen and give feedback that's productive to what they're going through. When we have three kids, we try to put one size fits all. Doesn't happen. There's a reason why we say older kid acts this way, middle kids act this way, babies act this way. Why is that true? Well, they're not born that way. We socialize them that way. All right. Provide a game plan with <clears throat> victory attached to it. Victory in Jesus. Not mediocrity in Jesus, not losing in Jesus. That's not in the song. So provide a game plan. Here's how we're going to conquer Satan. Here's how we're going to conquer life. Here's how we're going to conquer your life. Here's how you're going to get married and have kids and replicate everything I've taught you. And here's how you're going to be a successful part of the community. Why? Because I'm going to mirror it for you. I'm going to demonstrate how to do this right first. I tell parents all the time, if you want your kids to be a success, you go first. It's that simple. How to use knowledge. See, knowledge and wisdom aren't the same thing. Wisdom's being able to take the knowledge and use it. Knowledge is great. We can sit, if that were true, every single college graduate we have right now would be immensely wealthy and successful. What knowledge are you learning? What did you learn? Right now, a high school diploma, you can wipe your butt with it. 
Doesn't mean anything because the kids didn't learn anything. I used to, I, I had the periodic table memorized. How many people still do that? I can still remember a lot of those on the periodic table. I've forgotten everything else, but I can remember it. I've forgotten everything else. I can remember who won the 72 Super Bowl, but I can't remember anything else, right? So knowledge, how to apply the knowledge with adding to understanding wealth. Does God want us all wealthy? Yes, but why? What's our job again? He'll sit, cast out the devils, preach the gospel. God wants us wealthy to be passed through corporation for Jesus, right? If you need a school, build it. If you need a hospital, build it. If that widow over there needs money, give it to her. If that guy over there needs his house paid off, do it. If that guy over here needs a car, do it. See, God wants us all to be wealthy. He gives us the power to be wealthy. So why are only 1% really wealthy? A lack of demonstration. And then why do a lot of wealth by the third generation go zero? Goes to zero. You can have hundreds of millions of dollars, billions, and it goes to zero. Because the guy at the top didn't teach the guy at the bottom how to do it right. Replicate behaviors that the Father wants you to replicate. Look at Jesus, his whole family. Yeah, Jesus was the son of God, but his brothers and sisters weren't. And they were all successful. Why? I think Joseph probably did a pretty good job. And grandma and grandpa. If you know anything about Mary's parents, wow, were they exceptional. But they were older, but they taught Mary everything she needed to know through, through the Torah. All right. Support means more than financial. In our generation, it meant money, right? Our father went to work. He busted his butt for 12 to 15 hours a day. Then on Saturday, she mowed the grass, worked in the garden, washed the car. On Sundays, we didn't go to church, but everybody else who did. In our house, we had pancakes and gospel jubilee on the, on the TV. Okay, my dad never went to church, but we watched gospel jubilee for three hours on Sunday. I was confused. Because I'm like, Dad, we don't believe in God. Why aren't we watching this? Every Sunday, I'd go, why aren't we watching this? It's good music, though. Um, but be there. I was at every single event my stepson ever did and paid for it. He got to meet Coach K because I sent him to meet him because he, he helped me out with some stuff when I was a high school coach. Sent him away far so he could meet all those guys. Still has a relationship with one of those guys. All these things we did, he's met more pro athletes than he could ever imagine because it's what he liked. He liked sports. He liked meeting them. So I, I never missed a ball game. I went without sleep. I used to get up at 3 in the morning so I could get stuff done so I could be at his game. I went eight years without any sleep just to support this kid. Um, so I was there. I was present. He needed to see his father marrying the father because who's always with us? God. We cannot separate ourselves from him because he's in every single cell in our body. So it's not possible. Now, here's one of the big ones. Words and deeds have to act. Uh, uh, words and deeds have to match. I love my family, but you never spend time with them. Don't drink, but I'm going to guzzle a fifth of vodka. Don't do this, but I'm going to do it. Don't do, as I, don't do as I do, do as I say. Words and deeds always have to match. If they don't match, there comes confusion and chaos, and they will not believe that he is real, and they will believe that God's not good. Even though they read it from this book right here, they won't believe one word. They'll think this is a fable like I did. I thought Jesus was just like the Easter Bunny. If I put money underneath my, pay, uh, my pillow, maybe Jesus will show up. That's why I didn't think Jesus was real. Nobody had ever mirrored the actions and behaviors because I didn't have a role model at home. See, the greatest gift you can ever have is people go, who's your hero? My mom and dad. I've had one kid answer that in 33 years of what I do. One. It's always an athlete, a model. I used to throw up in my mouth when people would say Kim Kardashian. But, um, you know, if that's your role model... I can tell you how that life's getting ready to end. But role model, task, and behavior. How are you handling the day-to-day? -day? How are you handling the tough? How are you handling the good and the bad times? They're watching, and they will mirror. People always go, well, I got my mom's my temper. No, it's not genetic. It's just a behavioral pattern. Well, alcoholism runs in our family. No, it's a behavior. You're not born with alcoholism. If you don't ever drink alcohol, you don't have it. I'm tired of people saying we're predisposed. No, you watch somebody else get drunk. 
You don't have Tay-Sachs. You don't have cystic fibrosis. See, those are within a, a, a line. The rest of these are just replicated behaviors that we've labeled illnesses so we can prescribe for them. Or tell people that, oh, you poor thing, you're going to have to go to counseling the rest of your life. Or you're going to have to take drugs the rest of your life. Now, let's get more into now. Why are we risking being a communist country right now? Because men are, aren't fighting for freedom. We got lazy. And we've let women set the agenda. Women have just about ruined every single activity in the United States. NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, almost ruined. I'm surprised that, that the NFL's not turned into flag football. Yeah, I had some concussions. I've had seven. One for the baseball bat, one with a meat hook to the face. Actually, three. One with a crowbar to the back of the head. Um, told you I was no angel. And then the rest were either football or, or, or whatever. I think I may have had more than seven. Um, but what's freedom worth? See, we've got an election coming up that if, that if the wrong team wins, uh, we'll be a communist nation in two years. And then the New World Order will come in and it's over. Because people like me will go to prison, which I don't have any problem with. Now, I am tired of people going, I'm voting for a prisoner. All my heroes were in jail. Please stop saying that. For one, Donald Trump didn't break any laws. He's just got a corrupt jury and everything that's doing this. Close it. You're comparing yourself to the first century church, and that's not even close to being true. When you got saved back then, that was a death sentence. Is it now? Really? You got your Starbucks. Now I'm doing coffee because we're just talking. You got your Starbucks. You got your air-conditioned church. You sat and listened to music for an hour, and you got a 20-minute sermonette with no Bible. Really? What are you risking? It's really time to risk your job, your money, your house to save your kids in our country. That's a risk. And right now, it ain't no risk coming out of the closet unless you're a patriot, straight white guy ready to fight for your country. That's a risk. Never run from it. I can't tell you how many times I almost got fired from teaching for not compromising. I remember one time, United Way. 299 teachers donated to United Way and I refused. And the only way you could wear... Jeans on Friday, tell you how easy people can be about off. Jeans on Friday. If every teacher contributes, everybody gets jeans on Friday. <clears throat> so my boss calls me into his office. He's smiling. He goes, you don't compromise. I respect that. I know I ain't going to talk you into it. So it's jeans on Friday anyway. I'm sorry I caused you all this pain. People were leaving dirty notes in my mailbox at school calling me names. I don't care. Well, if you know anything about me, you can imagine what I told those teachers when we were alone. They didn't bother me no more, and they didn't put notes in my box any longer. I'm not going to play. See, again, you mess with my family, your graveyard dead. Where are all the rest of the guys that feel that way? You mess with my country, same thing. See, when are we going to fight back? When are we going to call all our, our representatives and say, hey, man, we don't have to have you. When are we going to fix the voting machines? When are we going to do all these things? The tide has turned. Everybody's on the Trump train. Why? Because they realize that everything's going wrong and right off the rails. But until you fix the machines, it don't matter. Stalin was right. It doesn't matter who votes. It matters who counts them. So you might want to stand up for that right now. Now, as we wind this up, a few last things. Always apologize to your kids if you're wrong. Forgive me. I apologize. I screwed that up. See, God doesn't have to apologize because he never does anything wrong. He's perfect. You're not. They need to understand that he's perfect and you're not. But a lot of people, I was at a wedding recently where the pastor actually said to the bride, you never apologize. Well, for one, I would never say that during a wedding ceremony. Wow, I always try to be on the positive when I'm doing a wedding ceremony and somebody's in love and want to get married. But when you say that about the bride, we got a problem. Also, be their coach, not their friend or their fan. Don't be a fan of your kids. Nick Saban would chew you out whether you were a five-time All-American. Now they get to stay in school six years because of COVID. Um, or the last guy on the bench. Same thing with me. I don't care who you are. I'm going to tune you out if you do something wrong. I'm not your fan. I'm your coach, but I love you. I'm your father, and I love you, but I'm not going to be your fan. 
Big difference. That's not my job to be your friend or your fan. It's my job to be your father. Learn the difference. Understand the last thing I'm going to talk about. For one, let your kids experience everything they can. Take them places. If, you, if they're going over U.S. history, take them there. Talk to them about it. Take them to another country. The greatest gift you can ever give your kids is get out of the United States. It is a life-changing experience once you've gone to another country. You learn why we love the United States. Now they're being taught to hate the American flag. At Harvard, they booed the American flag. Now we know who goes there, a bunch of idiots, but SAT scores don't mean a whole lot anymore. Um, but they booed it. So now, last thing, and I want to get this through. This is a good word. It's not profanity. Every single individual made by God is unique. That's why we have a different fingerprint for every single person. Now, if that's true, can I homogenize my parenting or my kids? The answer is no. I have to treat them like they're unique and special because every kid was made for a different job in the kingdom. Just because you are gifted in something doesn't mean your kids will be. And just because they're gifted doesn't mean you will be. Just because you were a pro athlete doesn't mean you will be. It's funny, we were talking to a friend of ours. I will not use his name because he likes to be in the shadows. But he played for the Cardinals. and He was an All-American in three sports in high school, went on to play at Georgia and be an All-American. I looked at him one night. We were just eating, and I said, dude, is your kid a pro? No. He, he didn't even have to think. <laughs> These kids play college ball. I said, is he going to make it a major? Oh, no, never. I, I just told him to get his degree and go on with life. It's hilarious to see guys, not LeBron James, because his kid's not good enough to be in the NBA. His kid's not good enough to play in college. Um, he needed three more years of college. That just because you're good at it doesn't mean they are. So understand who they are, what they were built for, what God wanted them to do, and just get it done. Now, wrap that in. You teaching them about the Father. Well, if you, you always go to your grandparents' house, right? Grandma, Grandpa. I lived in my grandparents' house, right? So if that's true, are you taking them to the, your father's house? Do they understand why we go to church other than for the songs and the, and the punch and the crackers and for social time? It's a worship father. Are you getting them there? Are you stressing? Not that we go to church. Don't make this a religious exercise. Why are we going to church? And then you go to a church that teaches you the word. Because right now we got a lot of churches not teaching the word. It's like when I look up church websites, they all talk about, they take these cool photos and they talk about their guilty pleasures. You'll never see that on our website. I think that's crap. Why are we going to church? Learn about Father. If we're not learning about the Father, why are we going? It's a waste of time. I'm not going. And the satanic church... They go to learn about their father, Satan. They learn how to cast spells. They learn how to do despicable acts to other people. And they have sex and drink. All right, the church of Satan sounds like a whole lot more fun than the Christian church right now. Right? I've done both. I like to, go, I like to learn about my father. Southwest Believers Convention is coming up soon. I like it because I get to learn. And I get to learn from some of the best pastor, preacher, teachers on the planet. Why? Because he's my father, and I want to learn about him. Because the more I learn about him, the more I learn about me, and the better job I do here in my life, not, not as a pastor, but as a person. You know, do they understand tithing? Do they understand why we give and receive? A lot of people can give, they can't receive. Do they understand there are three baptisms, one from Jesus, one the Holy Spirit, and one by man? Do they understand the seven kinds of prayer? And do they understand that not one prayer fits all? Do they understand that the Bible's the source of God's word and what God's trying to tell them? Do they understand that God is the source and that faith is action, not sitting? If I have faith in something, I'm going to act on it. If I have faith in my trainer at the gym, I'm going to go train with them. If I have faith in my car, I'm going to go drive it. If I have faith in my boss paying me, I'm going to go to work. Has this made sense? Teach them Matthew 6 is not just a chapter, but if we seek God first, all things will be added. But again, this has to be mirrored. It makes me think of my next door neighbor growing up, Gary Carter. I talk about him all the time. I put him in every book. He's uh, from the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina. I always wanted to be either Cherokee or Lumbee because they have cool hair and dark skin. 
and I wanted both, and then I wanted to be skinnier and tall. I didn't get any of those. Um, but I was going through a lot. I'm a drug addict. I'm strung out. I'm worshiping Satan. And at 2 in the morning, for some reason, he decided he could let me come shoot basketball. And then he'd come out and just toss me the ball and just talk to me. I can't tell you. Let me think. I can't tell you how many nights we did that. Now, Gary is just turned 80. And I was very close to his wife. He's got great kids. The example there, her and her husband have three of the finest kids I think I've ever met. Why? Because her mom and dad were fine people. And, and I still talk about him. Guess how many kids like me talk about him? Yeah, I can't count them on, on 15 hands. See, I'm not the only kid. I just happen to be the kid at that stage. He was stuck with me because he lived beside me. Poor guy. I know he's like, oh, God, he's out there shooting again at 1 o'clock in the morning. Let me go out there. But he never acted like that. He'd come out, he'd have his sweats on, popping me the ball. We'd be out there an hour, and I'd apologize for waking him up. And then I'd go back home. I can't tell you how many nights I did that. And I'm like, I never thought, what am I doing? I'm waking these poor people up. But I was in such a bad headspace, it never really dawned on me that I was interrupting his life. And to hear him talk now, I wasn't. He tells me, well, I was put here for that. That was my job. And now it's like, I'm a pastor. And he's like, well, he's a pastor. Thought I'd be dead. I'm a pastor now. Because somebody threw a ball to me? Somebody validated that I was alive? So we have to validate people's existence to make them know that the Father validates that. See, we have a huge job. But if you look at 1 Timothy 3, how you're supposed to act, and then Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child, they will not depart. What we're seeing right now is the kids have not departed for how they were trained. Gen Z is the worst generation that this country and world's ever seen. Why? We trained them to be. They cannot display a behavior they were not trained to do. Because people always go, well, I don't know what happened to these kids. These kids are always doing Stop. We trained them to be that. We went to the pool the other day. We live on a golf course. And we went to the pool, which I can't stand to go to community pools. For one, the hygiene just by itself. I taught biology, so it gives me the ickies. I won't get in a public pool. But I get there, and some doofus has got rap music playing, as loud as he can have it, at a public pool with profanity. And this guy's in his 40s. Now, I'll go through the scenario. The old me would have gone over and smashed his phone and threatened to put him in the hospital. That's just how I did things. The pastor me can't do that. And because people are so weak now, who's wrong if I do that? Or well, it's me. Even though we're in a public space, he's intruding. I didn't come down here to listen to music. I came down to get in the pool. Well, not get in the pool. Watch my wife swim. But uh, now you're invading space and because it, it validates your self-esteem and other attributes of your life are probably smaller. Um, you get away with it? See, I, one of my favorite shows is Mr. In-Between. It's made in Australia. And he, Ray, it's funny, he's a hitman for the mob, but it's a comedy. And he's in an anger support group. I've had to go to one, by the way. Not mandated, well, sort of mandated. But okay, never mind, it's a whole other story. Pastor don't need to tell all the stories today. And he's in an anger management group. And the counselor, you just want to bludgeon this guy, they all do, but they'll go to jail if they do. Ask Ray, Ray, why do you do this? Well, why do people get away with this? Because we let them. Some guy knocked this little girl's ice cream out of her hand, so he said, baby, you wait right here, I'll be right back. And he went and proceeded to fix the problem. See, men have stopped fixing the problem and become the problem. I go to a pool to relax. Some idiot has profanity lace wrap at, at full volume. Now I could go to the Homer Association, you know what they're gonna tell me, aren't you? Because it's full of weak people too. So what do I do? I'm gonna buy a farm and move out in the middle of nowhere. So I can have my own pool without idiots. Guys, we're doing a lousy job. We're doing a lousy job. Now some are doing a great job. But there's a reason why I only had one kid in 33 years tell me his father was his hero. Because the rest of us aren't doing anything. We've let women take over everything, feelings take over everything. When are you going to get your place back? I watch too many men get neutered by their wives. Trust me. I do a lot of stuff to make my wife happy because I love her. I won't compromise and I'll be the first one to go shut up. 
I've had enough. We're done. Why? Why can I tell my wife to shut up? Because she's seen me live this out. And she knows if I'm that adamant about it, I got a good reason not to listen to it anymore. And it isn't my job to be the CEO. I've been a head coach. I've been a CEO. I take over a CEO for companies when I go in because a lot of times you hired me because you've done absolutely nothing right and you're losing money and you're on the door of bankruptcy. So I have to fix things. When are you going to be the CEO of your family? Stop letting your wife tell you what to do. Stop letting feelings rule. Stop letting music get in the way of church and the Bible. We think worship now is just music. No, that's just music. Worship is you spending time with the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit and you giving and receiving and receiving from Him and you giving Him love and appreciation and praise. That's worship. You can do that anywhere. We think we have to go to a, a box with musicians. And we won't go to that box with musicians unless we have 45 minutes to an hour of music that makes us feel good. And coffee and air conditioning. Tell Oyedipo that in Lagos, Nigeria where 250,000 people show up every Sunday, most outside, regardless of weather, to hear the word. And they've also walked 20 hours to get to church and walked 20 hours back. And it's hot in Africa. It's hotter than Georgia. And today it's in the 90s. No, it's not global warming. It's called summer in the South. It's just hot. If you grew up in the South, you're used to, oh, June. Wait till August. It's hot. Thank God for Mr. Carrier. So is it time? Is it time to be a man? Is it time to step up? Is it time to do everything you're supposed to do? Or do you keep on whimpering to the finish line? Remember, here's what's at stake. Your children and grandchildren in the world, your safety, my safety, freedom, and your place in heaven. Do you really want to gamble all that being weak? It's about time to step up and be a man. All right, as we close out, man, that cheerful sermon I've given today. But sometimes we don't need cheer. We don't need a pat on the back, and we don't need motivation. We need to hear what we're doing wrong and just fix it. That's how I do things. I'll pat you on the back if I can and also kick you in the butt. Sometimes it's the same move. Normally I try to kick you first, then, then, then pat you. But sometimes I have to do it in the reverse. It's your turn. Step up, understand who the boss is. It's not us, it's God. And then act like it. All right, let's pray and we'll get out of here. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to convict us and give us the roadmap that we need to go out and do what you've asked us to do the way you've asked us to do it and do it for our kids. In your heavenly name I pray, amen, through Yeshua's power. Go to our website, EncounterChrist.org. Uh, if you need prayer, if you want to be part of the giving, go over to give, go down. It's reoccurring at one time. Now remember, tithes, 10%, gross income, that goes to where you're being fed. If you want to sow a seed, make sure the Holy Spirit has told you to sow a seed to us, and then sow it. I'm not real big on begging for money. Yes, we're like every church, we need it, right? Every church does. Every business does. That's a no-brainer. However, do what the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart to do. I'm never going to beg for money. I'm never going to ask you to do it. I don't see it. I don't even know what our finances are. I've never seen them. I'm not allowed to talk about them or do anything with them. I don't write checks. I'm not on any accounts. So no, the pastor does not get your money. Um, so I have an external job. I own a company to where I earn my money. So easy enough with that. So thanks so much for stopping by. Let us know what we can do for you. If you want prayer, EncounterChrist.org is where you find us. Also, these will be on the website, so you can send people to them. So send people who need to hear these, and then they're placed on YouTube after that. All right, I'll see you next weekend. Take care.